Welcome to the Nestled Podcast. I'm April. And I'm Bailey. We are friends and neighbors who left our design business to champion a message of hospitality. We live in a time where deep connections are so hard to come by. But we want no part of that. Our desire is for people around us to be seen, heard, and known. And we want to take you on that journey with us. So come back each week to take a peek in our nest. As always, the door will be open. Hey everyone, today we have with us Kendall Vanderslice, which where is Vanderslice from? What is your uh, family background? It is Dutch, Dutch. but it's, it's a very, very Americanized Dutch name. Okay. Our family's been over here for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, you just don't hear it very often, at least not here. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know if it was like a, I don't know. I was just curious. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, Kendall is an author who has a new book and we're so excited to have her with us today. Thank you for joining us. And will you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your new book? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I am a baker and a writer. Um, I worked for a long time in the restaurant industry, um, mostly in baking and pastry. And But kind of throughout my whole time working in restaurants and working with food, I was always asking questions about how does this work intersect with my faith? And how does my interest in food intersect with my faith? Um, and so that just sparked many questions for me that ultimately led me to um, thinking about the Eucharist or communion and what is what is the purpose of this thing that Jesus gave us to remember himself. Um, why is it a meal? And so that's kind of been my driving question for a while now. Um, mm-hmm. And that is the driving question of my book. Um, so my book is called We Will Feast, Rethinking Dinner, Worship, and the Community of God. And it is the story of about 10 different churches that have their primary service, uh, their primary mode of worship is around the table. Um, But through telling their stories, I'm asking larger questions around what should be the relationship between Christians and the food that we eat and the ways that we eat and um, our our commitment to eating together. Mm Yeah. Yeah. I love how you mentioned that you got to this place of writing this book and doing that research because when you said, like, how does what I'm doing intersect with my faith? I think everyone should be asking that question. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's honestly how we ended up in this place of trying to encourage people to have people in their homes and share meals with them because we were doing interior design together. And it was the kind of the same thing of, like, how does this line up with our belief Mm -hmm. system? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if it yeah. if it doesn't intersect, then what are we doing? Right, you know, and that's kind of yeah. you know how we ended up here. And so I would encourage everybody to ask that question, and I think it can make your work a lot more fulfilling. Right, we yeah. as believers should be the most purposeful people. Mm-hmm. We have this message and this kingdom that we're putting on display, and so everything about our lives should be centered around that kingdom. And so we have this mm-hmm. opportunity to see that kingdom come in our everyday life. And at our church, we are um, the language that we use is uh, is that we're gospel fluent mm-hmm. that. We are mm-hmm. fluent in gospel that everyday life is weaved, the gospel is weaved into every part of our life. And of course, that um, one of the places that that naturally should intersect is at the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who just heard you mention like dinner churches or should, mm-hmm. and have no idea what that means, can you share just a little <laughs> bit about that without, you know, giving your whole book away? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, dinner churches are essentially churches that have their primary service around the table or over the course of a meal. Um, So most, for the most part, they're modeled after some descriptions of the early church, Mm -hmm. uh, descriptions that we see in the book of Acts. Um, It's also the context that the Apostle Paul is speaking to when he's writing his letters to the Corinthians. Um, And then we have some some kind of historical... um, records of this from Tertullian and um, a few other early church historians who basically wrote that um, when the church was gathering, they were gathered around the table. They were, um, they were worshiping over the course of a meal. And when they took um, the, the bread and the wine that Christ had given them, uh, they took that as an entire meal. And so um, dinner churches now are looking back at looking back at that mode of worship and essentially asking what have we lost when we've separated 
communion from the dinner table itself? And what will we get back if we, if we understand worship in the context of a meal? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how many churches did you study, visit, you know, spend time around in preparation for this book? There are, um, I think there are eight churches in the book Mm -hmm. that I visited. Um, And then there's also, I did some experiments of, um, of meals in my own home, Um, a kind of an experiment that I did with some friends, um, well, some friends of mine who did not know one another to test out um, kind of what happens over the course of a meal and how, how do you get to know people over a meal? Mm -hmm. And so that was not a a church or a worship service, but it was another kind of um, research angle that's yeah, in the book. Yeah. Um, but then I also tell stories of my own churches growing up. So they weren't necessarily dinner churches, but churches where food was central um, mm-hmm. and and rethinking the ways that uh, that those meals shaped me mm-hmm. as much as kind of the the worship of the church. Right. Yeah, our church isn't a dinner church, but we do have weekly in-home gatherings mm, in, around, in a a meal. D- around a meal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. And that is, um, I mean, some people call those community groups. You know, we call them city groups, whatever you want to call them. One of the central yeah. things that every one of those groups in our church has to do is have a meal. Um, yeah. Because there is something so special mm-hmm. about that. In, in kind of studying these dinner churches and, and writing this book, my goal was not so much to um, get other people to start dinner churches or mm-hmm. to 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 kind of I, – I didn't want to say, like, this is the new this way of doing it. This is the way. Right. That right. Everybody needs to do. Right. Instead, I wanted to say, you know, we all eat together mm-hmm. and um, wanted to kind of reframe – that role in the life of the church and say, this is not just the supplementary thing that we do that's optional. This is central to how we become community and how we build community. And so using dinner churches where this meal is a very explicit part of the worship to then help us reflect back on how can this inform the way that we eat together all of our meals Mm -hmm. and how can this really inform and make us more intentional in the meals that we do share as a church whether or not we do it as our primary service or we do it Sunday after the service or we do it during the week. Mm-hmm. I have a question about the the churches that you were a part of, these dinner churches. Were there any common threads? Because I assume they were across kind of the gamut of different churches. Mm-hmm. Um, common threads that you saw of certain things that were cultivated in those environments in all of them. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the churches ranged, I picked churches from a range of denominations, a range of geographic locations, a range of sizes, really trying to look for the commonalities in this Mm -hmm. broad diversity of churches. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the thing that was central to them all was that community, that community was central, but that the community was, was formed by entering into really uncomfortable moments with people who were not like yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really easy to think about community and try and build community and have it everyone be in a similar life phase, a similar socioeconomic background, um, just very similar to yourself. And that can be community and there can be um, a lot of benefit to being in you can grow a lot through community like that, but that's not the church. The right. church is this broad diversity, people from every you know nation and tongue, um, and a, the church needs to be able to. The church community should recognize the socioeconomic mm-hmm. um, differences and the injustices that exist mm-hmm. in the place where you live, and so these communities um, by by worshiping around the table and committing to those uncomfortable moments that take place around the table, we're creating a space where the church could really dig into this, um, this breadth of difference that exists in order to try and seek healing and wholeness and um, really understand the, the differences and the pain that comes through those differences Mm -hmm. in community. And I would imagine for the people who are part of those churches who get used to that, that it kind of automatically bleeds into the 
their own lives, their day to day, not just Sunday, you know? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I think one of the best things for me that I learned from our community groups over the years was then how, like, I was getting together with this group of believers, learning how to share a meal and have real conversation um, and actually hear each other's hearts. And then what it taught me to do was to invite in people who I didn't know. And, yeah. and have real conversations, and have real conversations mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and it not just yeah. be superficial. And I think that's a lesson that we all need to learn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we're ever going to get anywhere relationally with our mm-hmm. neighbors, especially those that don't look and act like us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's... um you know, it's so easy to romanticize the table and mm-hmm. romanticize what happens around the table and think of it as like this place where anyone can come together and and uh, build relationships. And mm-hmm. the reality is it just doesn't happen like that. Mm-hmm. That sometimes the table is a really glorious, powerful place where relationships are born. But um, like we all make jokes about the Thanksgiving table because it gets really awkward. And, right. And community is really painful and it's very vulnerable right. and these deep relationships can only form when we enter into that vulnerability and and share ourselves in a way that um that could end up to us us getting hurt but mm-hmm. also could um if we trust those that we're sharing around the table it asks them to hold our stories in this way that mm-hmm. um that that builds, I think, that deeper community that mm-hmm. that we're really called to, and that I think we long for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's it it's hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's much yeah. harder than it's really easy to say, like, oh, I'll invite people into my house, and we'll you know sit at the table, mm-hmm. and it'll all be great. But like for that to really work, it's hard. It's hard it work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and the hardest part about it, I think, is hanging in there when it does get awkward. And right. Hard. Yeah. Right. It's not like a checklist of, okay, well, I invited them over and that was great and now I've done it. Mm-hmm. But it's like inviting them over again. Well, yeah. the, the beauty of the family of God is that we are committing our lives to one another in a way of through the awkward. Mm-hmm. And even though I don't like you really naturally, we have yeah. this common bond in Christ. And so, like, we are bound together. Mm-hmm. And no matter what goes on, we're not pushing away from the table and saying like, okay, well, I'm done with them. Right. But instead, we're committing to like push through to have the conversations to confess and to love yes. and to forgive yes. and mm-hmm. all of those things. And then that's how we paint a picture to a world that doesn't, is not willing to push past the differences right. because naturally all of us mm-hmm. like ourselves. We like yeah. people who are like us, and mm-hmm. we feel comfortable around those who think like us and act like us and spend their money the way that we do and aren't going to make mm-hmm. us feel bad for our choices. And, you know, right. but there's this thing in the family of God that it, that's not what it looks like. It's right. iron sharpening iron. Do you find as a single woman that it can be more awkward? Um, I don't necessarily know if more awkward, but I think there is... There's not a vulnerability of going to church alone or stepping into kind of a dinner party alone or inviting people into my house because, you know, you don't have, you go alone. And so there's both a need for those moments of vulnerability and there's a real need for that deeper community and the real need for people to listen and to know me well Um, but there's also not that added safety of kind of a person that I Mm -hmm. go with and a person who even if the meal is awkward I can can leave and debrief with yeah right you can leave and go whoa so when they said this like what were we supposed to respond with (laughs) you know yeah that's true right and I think also you know it's it's for me when I when I moved here to so I live in Durham North Carolina and when I moved here I specifically looked for a house where I could fit a really large table because I knew that living alone, I needed to be able to have people into my house and have meals here, which has been definitely kind of the, it has just been my, my lifeline here in Durham, being able to have people into my home and to host meals. But there's also an added layer of, you know, it's just frankly more work to, Mm -hmm. uh, to host by yourself. Um, but also this added vulnerability of, of to, 
to be with people, to be with community means that I have to seek it out. That mm-hmm. like if I'm not if I'm not constantly texting people and saying like, hey, let's do something, then I will spend the entire day without human contact, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I'm an extrovert. And that's really not good for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think part of what kind of studying these dinner churches and really thinking a lot about meals and and especially the ways that the church can build community around meals, it's been this constant reminder that I think the that as the church, we're called to see those particular needs mm-hmm. of various families, families and life stages, and that we're called to be community in all of those stages. It's mm-hmm. it's really easy to kind of center the church around the nuclear family and and accommodate those needs and sort of forget about the needs of single people or people without children. Mm-hmm. But I also think that it's really easy to overlook the needs of families that Mm -hmm. there's kind of this assumed that like, if you are a nuclear family, then your needs are sort of met within yourself. And I think that's a really dangerous rhythm for the church to get into that, that single people need our married friends and our family friends, just as much as family friends need us. Yes. Um, That there's just this, this depth of wisdom and, and picture of the community of God that, really we all require of one another and that I think we eat together and are really intentional about building that diverse community. We're able to address these various needs that one another has in ways that no one can address on their own. Yeah. The reason that I brought that up and thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing about that is because I think it goes in both directions. Like for those of us who are married, we have to make sure that we are still inviting people in who are single and not just like oh you went on a date with someone you should have them y'all should come over together and we've never invited Mm -hmm. you over just to get to know you for who you Mm -hmm. are like you don't have to be a part of a couple right to come into Mm -hmm. our home but then like on the flip side I think singles do need to be proactive in like look I would love for somebody to invite me over and handle a meal yeah where I don't Mm -hmm. have to Mm mm-hmm you know, cook for all these people. I have to cook for every night. And so I think it's so important as members of the church that we do it in both directions. And you're right. Mm -hmm. Everybody at times is going to feel overlooked. Like when my husband and I, Mm -hmm. we started having kids very young and we felt this pull towards now we're lumped with the people who are married with kids, but all of y'all are our age and we would love to go. Mm -hmm. Like we see you getting together and going to movies and doing Mm -hmm. these things. And like, we can get a babysitter. We don't always have to have Mm -hmm. our baby with us. Right. And so I think it is important just to be conscious that we're loving all the, all the parts of the body, all of the members as well Mm -hmm. as we can, you know, just to see people. Yeah. 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 And I I think that one of the really beautiful things about um, dinner churches specifically, not just sharing not just sharing meals around the table, but really letting that be central to the church is that um, when the church is already addressing a real need, when the church is already addressing this need both for food and for community in church meals, then it becomes a it creates the space to for people to express their needs, but also makes it really safe to express your needs because you already know that some of your needs are being met. And so mm-hmm. it's this this kind of this platform for for being able to articulate needs that might not otherwise get articulated mm-hmm. um, because there's already an assurance that that a community is oriented towards addressing those needs. Yeah, I think that there is there's wisdom to be had from both sides and and I think mm-hmm. that as a church we're missing parts of our of our body when we're not experiencing the giftings of every individual Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and there are giftings in single people that the church may not be really being blessed by. Mm -hmm. And there are single people who may not be experiencing the giftings of married couples because there Mm -hmm. is this just assumptions made on both sides. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that it's just so important that we, that we see people and that we get to know people as individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all standing before God. Right. Just me yeah. and him. 
You know, right. I'm not standing yeah. there with my kids and my husband. Right. And um and right. and I think that it's important for us to I mean, of course, we are a family unit and there are, you know, we work together in this way and I think that each of us are better because God has allowed us to have one mm-hmm. another. But at the end of the day, like I'm still April. I'm mm-hmm. still myself mm-hmm. and a lot of times we have found in our line of work and in the church that oftentimes moms get lost Mm -hmm. and all of Mm -hmm. a sudden you start having a conversation and they're like, I don't even think I have any giftings. Right. I don't really know what I'm good at. Right. And, and so I think all of us to stop and like really see people and like call out the things in them and yeah. to, and to yeah. bless them in that way is so important. Right. Cause you can't always see it in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such a gift that, um, the close friendships between single people and, and moms can really bring out is that, you know, the, the topics of conversation that single people will bring to the table when, when hanging out with their mom friends are going to be very different than when mom friends are hanging out with other mom friends, because, mm-hmm. It's just such different phases of life, and it's, you know, it's, I think it just helps everyone remember more these deeper aspects of who they are. Mm -hmm. I was recently, last week, um, I was having a picnic with one of my, one of my friends and her kids, and, you know, we sat there the whole time, and, and Strudel, my dog, came with us, and the kids were climbing all over Strudel and climbing all over me the whole time, and, Mm -hmm. um, it was it was just so freeing to get to the point where, you know, my friend was not concerned by that and wasn't apologizing for it anymore because she knew that I needed the touch of kids and I needed kids crawling all over me and I needed the conversation that I was having with toddlers. And she needed the freedom from, you know, having her kids crawl all over her and she needed the adult conversation and she needed the the questions that I was asking and the, and the topics that I was having that, you know, that I was, that I needed to discuss. And Mm -hmm. it was just a a gift to both of us that just a conversation and a a form of communion that I wouldn't have had with other single people. And she wouldn't have had if she was picnicking with another mom who also was, you know, wrangling her kids. And it's just such a, we all have differing needs and they, they need to be addressed in this diverse community Mm -hmm. because they can't be addressed always by people just like us. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought the kids up in particular because I know my kids, friends, and even family who don't necessarily have kids or that aren't currently in a season where their kids are living with them, see my kids in a different way Mm -hmm. and are able to Mm -hmm. love on my kids in a different way because I have the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's not that my friends who have children don't love them. It's just that their focus has to be on their kids in that moment. And you know what I mean? It's just a different thing. And so I think that's another example of how like it takes all the parts Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it is so important to us that our kids are surrounded by people who love God and love people Mm -hmm. and are teaching them how to do that. And godly single men and women. Yes. Um, I, I don't ever want my kids or any of the single people in my life to think that you will be, effective for the kingdom of God when you're married, right? when you have mm-hmm. a family, mm-hmm. or even that that is the expectation. Or that and, that's the end goal. Right. right. I that's, don't want that to be the right. end goal for my kids. No. You know? And so um, I need them yeah. to see people who are living out the gospel in their everyday life single. Yep. And I need them to see people who are on the mission field, and I need them to see families, and I need them to see, uh, mm-hmm. you know, across the board, people who are living for Christ, who are dying to self, who mm-hmm. are giving themselves up for the yeah. gospel in every different way, because I don't know what the the end is for my kids. I don't right. know what their life is going to look like. And the Bible talks mm-hmm. a lot about singleness, right? <laughs> and about the blessing yeah. that it is yeah. to the church yeah. and what the blessing yeah. it is to, if you can live this way, how you your devotion to Christ and to his people is so great. And mm-hmm. so, you know, you, your heart is not divided in a lot of ways. And so I think that sometimes we downplay that and it's like, well, this is the season until right that other season. Right. Yeah. And I think also that um it it allows I I think when we kind of when the church shifts into this kind of binary of like 
single versus married or single until you're married. Mm -hmm. Um, It it loses out on both the benefits of these various seasons, but also doesn't let anyone really articulate the the difficulties of those various Mm -hmm. seasons. Um, And that when we have these relationships between uh, between folks in different life stages, it allows those who are single to be able to say, hey, you know, I experience loneliness in this way, or I experience um, isolation in this way, but I also experience freedom and joy in this other way. Um, and that also allows married folks to say, hey, I experience loneliness in this way, and and to really be able to pinpoint and identify, like, man, marriage is not the, 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 not the sure answer to right. our loneliness or to our needs for community and um it both allows us to articulate you know those those points of longing and the ways that they manifest themselves differently in these different phases um but also just point continually more towards our need for community our need for community as a whole church not just you know as as an individual family unit yeah yeah that's good so what advice would you give to single men or women who I mean, if any men actually listen to our podcast, the number's really low. It's low. But, but there are a there. few, and we love them. Yeah. We, we, love love, we probably know all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but what would advice would you give to single people who maybe just don't really have their legs under them as far as how to be hospitable, how to live communally in... It, not just the invitation, but being the one to initiate those relationships. I think that the the biggest thing is just uh, learning to ask and articulate your needs. Learning to to just tell people, this is what I'm experiencing. Because I have found that so many people just don't even realize it. That when I when I express my needs, I assume that my needs are really obvious. Um, mm-hmm. And they're not because... For people who aren't in this phase of life, they they don't know what it's like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they don't they don't even think about some of the things that are so natural for them that that I don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, really, just it's it is terrifying and it is vulnerable, and sometimes it's not met graciously. But learning to just express those needs and to to um, accept that it is not weakness to have mm-hmm. needs and it's not weakness to tell that your community that you, that you have needs and that you need them. Um, and I think that on the flip side, the, the advice that I also would give to married folks, um, is to, um, to be able to hear those needs and to, to really think creatively about how you might be able to address them, um, but then also to to dig deeper and and ask about what are my own needs that I could that I could ask of a single person to help with. Um, so that's the biggest thing is just really admitting our weakness and our and our and our need for others and our need for community. Um, but some other practical things, I think, um, you know, realizing that you don't have to have a big house or a fancy kitchen or a fancy meal to be hospitable. Um, that calling up a friend and saying like, hey, let's go for, you know, a walk on the trail and have a picnic is hospitality. Um, you know, I, I think there's plenty of moms of little kids who need something to get out of the house and, you know, and and have a bit of that freedom to be able to say, hey, if someone else plans an outing, like we can join in. Um, it gets us out of the house, gives us something to do. And so that's a, a form of hospitality. And you don't have to have a kitchen at all to go to the grocery store and pick up a few picnic things and and get a picnic blanket. Um, yeah, I the thing that has been most um, meaningful for me in this last year, the season that I'm in, has been a group of um, a group of friends that I have that we're all in different phases. Um, some married, some engaged, a couple of us single, um, and we have dinner together three nights a week. We rotate between one another's homes. Um, and we just each take turns cooking and it's usually pretty simple. It usually just lasts about 30 to 45 minutes. If someone can't make it, we just pack up their meal for them and either drop it off at their house or they swing by and pick it up. Um, but it's a way of each of us just has to cook one night a week and to know 
you know, to be able to grocery shop and say like, I only have to provide dinner for myself once. Um, and the rest are taken care of. It's a gift to all of us. You know, it's, it's, I think it's probably been the most meaningful to, to me and the one other single person because otherwise we'd be eating alone, but it's been such a gift to our other friends too. Um, who are also very busy and also overwhelmed by cooking and really love um, hosting others. And it's, it's, it's been a gift. And when it becomes that just rhythm and pattern, then hospitality is way less overwhelming because we expect that like our homes are going to be messy and that there's going to be dishes in the sink and that, you know, we know everyone just got off work. And so the meal might just be sandwiches or it might be a box of macaroni and cheese and that's perfectly okay. Um, but it's, it's a built-in community every night. It's a built-in meal every night. Um, and I think that that shifts our rhythms um, even beyond those meals to our relationships with one another and our relationships with hospitality in our homes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Okay, to sort of wrap this up, and then we'll let you tell us word about your book. What is something that you are loving right now and something that you are leaving? Oh, well, something I am loving is the time to read books for fun. Mm. Um, <laughs> yes, this kind of this pairs with the something that I'm leaving. So okay. I actually graduate <laughs> next Saturday. Um, I'm Woo-hoo! graduating from seminary, which is very exciting. So I am I am leaving this season of being a student behind. Um, and with that, I am loving, loving the time to read books for fun. So just pleasure read. <laughs> Yes, I've had a bookshelf that has been sort of building over the last couple of years that I just haven't had time to read. And so it was really fun to put all the academic books behind me and dig into the fun books now. Yeah. What are you reading right now? Um, I just started reading um, Aaliyah Joy's Glorious Weakness. Okay, I haven't heard of that. Oh, yeah, she's she's wonderful. Um, It is it's basically a book about weakness (laughs) and admitting her. Kind of the like opposite of the um, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, like take care of yourself sort of thing, and much more of like um, the the subtitle is discovering God and all we lack. Um, I have to look into that. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Aaliyah is wonderful. I highly recommend it. I'm only a few pages in, but um, so far it's great. Um, and I also I just finished Ruth Reichel's book Save Me the Plums, um, which is her memoir of her time as the editor of Gourmet Magazine. So ah. it's also a fun read. I've been wrestling back and forth between like the food writing and the uh, more spiritual. <laughs> the spiritual. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. yeah. Okay. So when this comes out, your book will have been released into the world. Yay. So where can people find it? Uh, you can find it wherever books are sold. Um, Amazon, christianbook.com, Barnes and Noble. Gosh, I think there's a few other websites too, but my own website has the links to all of the books. Um, and then also, so my website is www.kendallvanderslice.com. Um, and if you go to the, the page for my book, I also have links to um, a book club guide uh, for book clubs to read together. And then also a pastor's or church leader's guide for um, leaders of churches to read the book in community with their church. Mm-hmm. Um, and a few other fun, fun resources there as well. And are you anywhere else on the internet that people can find you and follow you? Yes, I'm on Instagram at, and on Twitter at KV Slice. Um, and then I also have a monthly newsletter that you can find. It's tinyletter.com slash edible dash theology. Nice. Thank you so much for yes. talking to us, Kendall. This was wonderful. It was so great Absolutely. to meet you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, and I want you to send us a recipe that people who aren't pastry chefs <laughs> can make and a photo so we can share it with our listeners, if you don't mind. Something that yeah, I just I thought about that earlier. I was like, I want a recipe. Yeah. I see yeah. all your pretty <laughs> breads and stuff. Now, granted, I have like one little packet of yeast at right. my house. It's not like I got all the <laughs> ingredients for whatever. But <laughs> That's okay. I think bread, I think bread should be the simplest thing that everyone should make. It's, I think, I think a lot of folks make bread really complicated, but it's actually like the simplest food there is. So, send us the easiest bread recipe you have. (laughs) I will. I will do just that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys.